Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of From Page to Stage. I'm your host, Wendy Corner, and in this podcast, we interview people who have done both the page and the stage. And we interview people who have done the page and are not quite so familiar, maybe even comfortable, with the stage bit yet. So the idea is, for a podcast, it's a one-on-one conversation. It's okay to talk to somebody about what you do, isn't it? I hope so. This is what we're doing today. So today I have the joy and pleasure of introducing you to a gorgeous man, Randy Brown, who is in, over to you, Randy. I will let you do the rest of it. Just tell us a bit about who you are okay. and what's brought you to this place in your life. Cliff notes. Sure. Thank you. Sure. So I'm coming to you from Iowa. I, we're in the Midwest, a right smack and dab in the middle of uh, the good old U.S. of A. And uh, I'm actually living in my uh, hometown uh, and I enjoy it like crazy. I travel a lot, so I'm not here a, a lot, but but I, I do like it here. And, uh, you know, be, because of sort of what happened to our world here a few years ago with everybody going virtual and and meeting people online, um, that's where I, I met Wendy. And thank goodness, uh, uh, because of uh, Tyson Sharp and, and his international program of bringing together like-minded um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, from all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, that's where I met her and hundreds of other great people. And it was, it, the, the timing of it was phenomenal, mm -hmm. uh, really, because I think we all needed that. You know, we needed that outlet of people. Mm -hmm. And so you are just, you know, one of the great folks that I got a chance to meet during that time. And, and we've certainly stayed in touch and and communicated, which has been awesome. That's what it's all about. And so that's how that's how that happened. But I'll t I'll tell you, I but my story is a pretty simple one, really. Um, I was a young guy of about eight years old, and I was at a high school basketball practice. And in short order, what happened was I was totally enamored by what was going on. I knew the coach who was in charge that day, a friend of our family, and my father was the local sports writer. And so I knew all the coaches. And here this little eight-year-old guy's watching practice, blown away by how big these players are and how this coach is in charge and he's leading and he's maybe, maybe uh, yelling a little bit at a couple of them to get going. And I just, the whole dynamic of it was just intoxicating to me. And I learned from my father that this, that was actually part of his job. He actually, that's what he does for work. And I go, you mean you can come to the gym and be involved with basketball and that's your job? And little did I know, but at that age, on that day, I kind of set my my course of, of what my profession would be. I loved it, basketball, obviously, as a kid, like a lot of kids do, but I was already looking into what I was going to do for a profession at that age. It was a magical day, and I, I love talking about it. And it really set the course for the next, gosh, to 35 years of my life. I became a high school coach uh, after graduating from college. Um, I was a high school coach for five years, but my, my goal was to be a, a collegiate coach. And, and I had seen enough of the big arenas and, and knew the importance of what college basketball was all about. And I thought that would be uh, just an unbelievable goal to go after. And I did go after it. I was very intentional about all the steps and it worked and, and it happened. And so I just figured I would coach the rest of my, rest of my career. And um, it didn't work out that way. So the, the, the real interesting, I think, part of my story is what happened when that was all taken from me, uh, taken That's from hilarious. me by myself, actually self-inflicted, um, okay. you know, due to some decisions I made. And all of a sudden that eight year old kid who wanted to be that coach was no longer that coach. And that was some other very interesting factors that were going on in my life really put me at a place where I had to figure out who in the heck I was, mm -hmm. what 
my role on this earth was what 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 was i really here for and got to spend a lot of years trying to figure that out and of course i'm still pretty much figuring it out but i think i know i know exactly why i'm here and i know exactly what i'm called to do so that's really um honestly a part that when people hear this um they're going to say oh, uh, boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose that path. And it's not that I chose the path. I certainly made the decisions that led to the path, but I love the path. I really do. Uh, even though it comes with a lot of hurt and a lot, a lot of really tough sledding and a ton of adversity, where it's put me and where it's allowed me to see ahead has been the real gift in all of that that has happened with me. It's very often the case, isn't it? When when we're going through the crap, mess, trauma, call it what you will, you don't appreciate it, <laughs> though. Why would you? But looking back on it afterwards, you can see that it may have been a um, an unresourceful decision you made, which led to consequences which had to play out. Right. But from that... As you say, you've gone in a completely different direction and one mm. that you wouldn't necessarily have come to right. without that slightly questionable decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back is a phenomenal thing. Yes. And in the moment, like you said, and it's so true, in the moment, it will, I mean, it brought me to my knees. It was as low as as I and as dark a world as I ever could imagine. Um, but I just knew because I'm a believer, um, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a believer. And I knew because I have learned that the things that happen on this earth are to prepare us for when we're not on this earth. And I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. And so when it happens, I, I, you know, you really got to just kind of buck, you got to buck it up and get tough and just say, I'm going to learn all I can through this because it's going to serve me well. And it'll serve a lot of other people well also down yes. the road. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, the coming on to, to our audience for a second, a lot of our audience have got that burning passion to share what's happened, which has created a void which they've, they've discovered, they've filled the gap, they've got a, um, a business that they, is dealing with that gap. They've written part either a multi-author book, been part of that, or they have actually written their own solo book because they're passionate about getting that message out on paper. Yes. And the next step is now to take that onto, quotes, a stage, depends on what your right. definition of stage is. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you, Randy, the, when did you write your book? My book uh, was published in 2018. 2018, right. And so I actually you wrote prior it. prior to that? Oh, excuse me? Were you writing prior to that? <laughs> I've always written. Uh, n not, not professionally, but I'm, I, I'm really a paper and pen guy. And, and I will say I did have an advantage, though, in, in the, the writing part of all this, that my father and my oldest brother were award-winning uh, statewide and national sports writers. And I mean, as good as there is. Right. And um, I got a little bit of that and I enjoy writing. So mm -hmm. I have always, I've always kind of come across it pretty naturally but, and we haven't got to the incarceration part of my story yet, but when I was incarcerated, one of the things I did, Wendy, is I wrote my book. You wrote your book inside? Yes. Okay. Do yes. you want to share about your incarceration? I can. Yes. It, it probably is a, is a good, as good time as, as any. Mm -hmm. uh, but what has to come before that uh, are, are two really, um, really, really tragic um, stories. You know, one is, is as a college basketball coach, you're away from home a lot. Typically, you're, 
you run out to practice, you run out and, and recruit or you r- run to games and, and you're, you're gone a lot. And this one particular day, our oldest daughter at that time was four years old. It was the day after her first birthday. And I left on any other day, like I would go to practice and had no idea I would not see her alive again. And, um, I was, uh, I was scurried from the basketball floor that day up to the local hospital and uh, just thrown into a world of confusion and just chaos um, in the emergency room with our four-year-old daughter who had passed in about an hour uh, from the time that, that her, her mom realized something was wrong and, until, she, until we lost her. Oh. And uh, on, on that day, in that moment, <clears throat> I had always kind of heard a, a comment <clears throat> that says that when you lose a child, uh, you, you are changed forever. Your world changes forever. Mm-hmm. And I now know that who, whoever that quote is attributed to lost a child yes. because it immediately changed forever for me. And there's no blueprint for it. You're not prepared for it. And when something like that happens, we've all had things. I call them big hurts. Mm -hmm. These are the big hurts in your life. And we have a lot of hurts, but this is a big hurt. Uh, Didn't quite know how to react. I I did know that I had my folks and I had my faith and I knew that would carry me through. What I didn't know is, is the severity of the pain and the, uh, I, I, I guess, um, just wanting something that would take the pain away. And, and I did that by working extraordinary amounts of hours at my job mm-hmm. because I loved it and it numbed me. It really did. Uh, and the use of alcohol, which I, I ramped up. Uh, because I could go to a place with alcohol where, where at least for a little bit, things weren't back to normal or okay, but they were different. And they were, it, it is that, it's just that, that feeling of numbness, you know, to take you away from the reality. Yeah. Uh, and I hate to tell you that in a, in a six year period, uh, we, we lost our, our daughter, I just mentioned Meredith, but we also lost our third oldest daughter, Natalie, uh, within a six year period. Mm-hmm. And Natalie was almost four years old also of the same rare Dishes. disease that attacked her and, and, and broke down her, her major organs in, in, in a very quick period of time. And she so was again, again, a very swift. Yes. Death. Very. Oh, Randy. Very. It's unimaginable. Between the the death of Meredith and Natalie, our second oldest daughter was hospitalized three times of the same disease. And um, there there got to be a point at where where I was pretty much just starting my day off and just doing what I could do, but I really wasn't there. I really wasn't there when we lost Natalie and this is, this had happened twice. Claire, fortunately, well, she was a miracle. She made it through and, um, and survived. But when it happened the second time, I just basically checked. I really kind of checked out of life. Mm -hmm. I, I I had, I had very little, um, I had very little enthusiasm for my life. I, and if my kids were going to go before me, I just felt like I might as well join them. I mean, I was in that place and I had a very, very important conversation with my senior pastor, who's also a very good friend of mine, David Staff, about what happens if someone commits suicide and takes their own life. What happens to them in eternity? I was worried about it, but that's how serious I was about not wanting to be around, being totally disconnected. And, And so... Uh, in his infinite wisdom, uh, he gave me some great advice and um, decided that certainly wasn't going to be the, 
the way I was going to choose to go. I had, um, we, we had a fourth daughter and then we, we had Claire who made it. So we still had, had two girls and they're now, by the way, 33 and, uh, and 27. And so, uh, they have, uh, you know, just been an incredible part of my life. But, uh, at, you know, at that point, <clears throat> actually, I got to the point where I didn't know how I was going to get through things, but I knew that I needed more. And it was a, it was a very dangerous place to be because I turned to pornography at that time. And I thought here in this safe little world on my own uh, computer, and I had just lost a job and I was at home for a year watching the two girls and taking care of them. And I began to casually uh, watch pornography, but casually came to like any addiction where it builds and it builds and, and, and certain things, um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's no, there's none of the dopamine rush anymore. And you go to the next high, as mm -hmm. they say, uh, yeah. depending on, on, on what the addiction is. I mean, it could be one of right thousands of things, but, um, so that was the path that I was on and I knew I was in a bad place. And I wasn't uh, in a situation where I wanted to share that with anybody. I just wanted to keep it secret. Mm -hmm. um, it was allowing me. The problem was, Wendy, it was keeping me up at night for hours and hours and hours and shutting that computer down and, and going to bed to get a couple precious hours and then, and then uh, another day. So um, where does our incarceration come in? I got to the point where... I thought I was uh, probably bulletproof and uh, any image uh, that, that I may gather from the internet um, over email that was uh, close or below the age of consent, which is 18, uh, would certainly be illegal. And that happened and they were in my possession. And um, uh, because of a, 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 and I think there were so many there were so many things that happened during that time that I can see that they it, it, it they were supposed to be presented in my life so that I could make a poor decision and something devastating could happen from it. And that's exactly what happened. I was in a chat room. And if people don't know what a chat room is, I'm just here to tell you that uh, it's 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 not it's no safe place of fantasy and and that's it it's a it's a dangerous place and i i came out of a chat room one night with about three other people and someone from that room called the exploited children's hotline because of the nature of the conversation in that room mm -hmm. and little did i know but that started uh i i became a name that that the authorities were well aware of and they followed me yeah. for a series mm -hmm. of years and so here i lived a six-year life of uh, of a second person mm -hmm. you know um a life of of pornography and i i if if anybody wants to know what that's like i'll tell you this because um I used to say all the time, and I, I, I can still feel it, that, you know, I felt like I was carrying around a dead man. Mm -hmm. That I, 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 and I was that dead man, and I was carrying him around all day. And he was heavy, and it was a load, but I did. Mm -hmm. Until I got the opportunity to fess up one day in front of the authorities and say, I am tired I know this is wrong. I will give you everything that you desire. Um, I want this done with. Well, that, that that's all well and good, and and but it, I I knew that what was waiting for me was not. There were still consequences. Yes, yes, major consequences. But you know what? In that moment, I was actually in my office at at at, at uh, Hilton Coliseum in Ames, Iowa, and. In that moment, I knew, regardless of consequences, I was ready for this. Mm -hmm. It was time. Mm -hmm. I was tired of being the phony, being the man behind the curtain, not, not being that, that guy of integrity that was this public figure during the day mm -hmm. out in front of huge crowds and being this coach. 
And so you, you, you got a job somebody, by this time. You, you'd managed to get employment again. Um, yes, yes, right. I had, I had, and, and, and really the best job that, that I had my entire coaching career, mm. unbelievable job. And I, I threw it all away. Mm. I threw it all away. And for six years, I, I lived a lie, yeah. but I was ready. And what happened from that point that night until today, as we speak, it is unbelievable how things have just lined up. Now, you're going to say, oh, there's no way that you could ever say that going to prison uh, was a good thing for, for your life. Well, I, I, I might be one of the few, but I am one who would say that. Yes, I would, because of some really incredible things that have happened. So that's, that's how I found myself incarcerated. I was in federal right. uh, medium security for two years in, in a place uh, in North Carolina, and um uh, scared guessing, to death. I'm guessing, and, excuse me, interrupting that, that obviously with a record like that, you were, as you said, you weren't able to go back into the coaching, coaching sphere. Correct. correct. Um, so what was next? What happened after the, the, I mean, obviously in that time you, you wrote your book, tell us a bit more about your book, would you? Yes. So I sat down one day with a, with a spiral notebook. And I, I had no plan other than I need to write. I felt something like ready to explode inside me. And then I needed to emote. And, and, and maybe that would be a way to grieve. Maybe that would be a way to, to get rid of uh, just some really serious emotional baggage and, and things. And, and plus, I'm in an environment where you're looking over your shoulder anyway. I mean, it's yes. not a it's a i describe it as a world inside a world yes and it's not a great world no it's not so all of those things are are part of the equation but i wrote wendy and i wrote and i wrote and i wrote and i write horribly and i write really big so i mean i can fill a page pretty quick and rip the page and there we go now page two page three page four and and then i also uh made sure that every word I wrote was typewritten. So I would take my ID and I would hand it in and, and get a, a um, typewriter with, with one of the black cartridges that, which I had to buy at the commissary. And I went through a couple dozen of those because I wanted every piece of, of that maybe book, just my thoughts, but I, I, I didn't want anything to happen to him while I was there. Sure. So sure. I sent him home piecemeal right, right. until I mean, that, three... that was going to be my question were you able to keep hold of your manuscript yes because my experience of being in and out of, of as a visitor um yes. to jails is that that very often anything that the prisoners do is confiscated that's that was my fear yeah and I said I said that's not going to happen to me so when I got home I had 352 typewritten pages and I would say though about a fifth ended up in the book because okay. so much happened when I, when I got home and some, some years passed and I began writing again, but it is, isn't that crazy? It was just, it was just like pouring out of me. Like I had to do it yes. and it felt very therapeutic and I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed yeah. that process. And well, so it gets it out of you. Otherwise, as you said, the, the, um, and, and, and getting you to this position of actually facing up in the first place, the the un the, the living a lie. Yes. It's like a cancer in your bones, to oh, quote David. Um, it's horrible. So the fact that you'd one fessed up, two ended up in jail, and then three vomited out your feelings on paper and then typed up. I can I can appreciate that that would have been a burden at least partially lifted if not fully lifted right. so wow yeah right now obviously the the book was started in jail yes but there's extra it wasn't purely my life within these walls right right so tell us a bit what happened afterwards <laughs> well one of the great blessings in my life is when I when I was sentenced in, in federal court in April of 2003, 
the judge recommended that I be sent to this facility in North Carolina. I didn't, I'd never heard of the place, had no idea why he would ever send me that far away. And I immediately was thinking not very good thoughts about him until he said, the reason I'm sending you there is um, I believe that you are the kind of person that can really benefit from a treatment program. Right. And at that time, there were only three in the country in, in the Bureau of Prisons three and this was the number one with a 10-year waiting list and i was ushered in literally a couple about a month and a half later and walked right in and started that program and oh. spent my two years it's a two-year program i mean the timing and everything and i, I i'll tell you what that judge did me an unbelievable favor what a gesture and i didn't i fought it at the time and i fought it for six months actually because i didn't want to be one of those guys right you can tell how how de defensive and and how just all just full of myself that i was when i went in there but mm -hmm. the the doctors and treatment specialists were world class which i had no idea and they knew what they were doing every step of the way and in in their incredible way of just asking the right questions and and it, but, but yet being you know making you accountable they were able to break me and then the last year and a half to turn me to to the right direction and i said i said you got me i will do anything and everything i can to become the best person i can coming out of here and that was something that I can't explain. I don't know how that happened. I don't know why Judge Longstaff thought me. Uh, I mean, he sentenced hundreds and hundreds of people, how it worked for me to, to step right in and start. And I will tell you this, that I don't want to know who this guy would have been two years later without that treatment program. I got, I got 2,400 hours of me time to work on me in an environment that's uh, i call it a no bs environment you you, yes. you know we're, we're not there in there to laugh and have a good time and joke around it was yes. serious serious yes. stuff in a serious environment thank goodness because i needed that mm -hmm. i needed every second of that mm -hmm. and who knows how i would have come out but yeah. i came out um you know, victimization and empathy and um, um, the, the cognitive distortions uh, the, and our mind is so powerful. And the things mm. that I had got myself to believe and accept were unbelievable, um, all, for, all for the sake of taking away some pain. It, it's just and they, they taught all of that to me, mm. how all that worked. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. and I started to get it. Yeah. And what a what a godsend I, had it not been for that program and those doctors and treatment specialists i don't know i owe them so much was it hard you better believe it was it was really so probably the most difficult thing i've ever done other than having to having to have a funeral for organize a funeral for my two daughters um but was it worth it absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely and i just think it's one of the great blessings in my life I can't explain it. I just know what happened. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Randy. So all of this plus what you've done since is in your book? Yes, pretty much. Up until 2018. Up until 18, right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I knew, I can tell you this, that in 18, I knew that I wanted to speak. I still yet did not understand how a person's story can be put in a book and how the contents of that book can become a message that can absolutely change lives. I didn't get that, how that process goes from A to B and B to C. I just wrote a book and I thought that was going to be good enough. I've learned a lot since then, obviously, but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a process. So I would say since 18, it's just been you know, leaning on professionals, uh, th those are really good at, at, at teaching people how to prepare themselves to give a message, mm -hmm. to write it, to craft it, to have the right wording, to, to get yourself in a position where uh, you can have people um, bring you in and, and speak mm -hmm. to others. So 
that's the real joy. That's what I love. Is there another book coming? There is. Ah. There is. Uh, I'm a big believer in the idea of the invisible impact. And I've I've chart I've I've sketched out some chapters, so I would say it's already started. And I think I think we all have an unbelievable gift, and I really think we have a responsibility to share with others throughout the course of our life. We never know when a a piece of advice or a nugget or a seeds, I call them. You know, I'm in the I'm in the state of Iowa where 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 we are known for we're known for a lot of things, but we're really known for two things, coin and or corn and soybeans. And okay. so the, the idea of dropping a kernel of corn, you never know how that thing is going to come to fruition. And, and will it uh, allow somebody to eat that normally wouldn't be able to eat? And I believe in planting seeds. And you never know when one of your seeds is going to hit someone at the right time, at the yes. perfect uh discourse in in their life and really make a huge difference um and i always turn to and and thank you for being a podcaster and and, and for sharing um you know great great words and wisdom and things uh via podcast because when those things are recorded and saved you never know when a person might access any of your podcasts and be going down the road and, and they either might feel like they want to drive off the bridge or they want to keep going and listen to this podcast. You hear about that, right? And I just know that, that there are podcasts every day that people hear and they start to change their lives because of that invisible impact. So I'm excited about it. So oh, yeah. There, there's have, you, have you got a target date? I don't. Okay. I don't. Still it's, 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 it's on a, it's on a list of, uh, well, uh, I, I have a priority list and, and the heavy ones are up top. So it's on Good. the list though. Good for you. Good for you. Cause I mean, was, as you were saying about the, the idea of sharing your story, one of the things that, that a lot of authors that I work with, they're reluctant to get on stage. What are people going to think of me? Oh my God. Well, actually it's not about you. It's about, them it's about the audience and as you've said you never know when those seeds that you are dropping are going to hit good soil and they're going to go i need to hear that right now so that's why it's so important audience that you do grab your courage in both hands and go okay somebody else needs to hear this i have gone through this crap for a reason you may not, and God willing, you haven't had such a traumatic experience as Randy has through his life. However, we all have a message to share. And there'll be somebody out there listening, waiting for your message. So please don't mm -hmm. deny them. If mm -hmm. you're concerned about a stage being the raised thing with a microphone in your hand and you spouting forth, it doesn't have to be. Yes. A one-on-one -on -one conversation like Randy and I are having now, it's called a podcast. Let's do right. that to start with. And as you say, Randy, yes. those are evergreen. They never yes. go away. They're recorded they and you can be having impact for years to come. Yes. Life enriching impact. Yes. In a in a little digital clip that yeah. people are that people are traveling the world right now listening to podcasts. Think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's encouraging to me. Yes. Yeah. You, and you never know when they're going to access one. You, you know, I, I like your comment about a lot of people who have not spoken think and, and and they're leery about getting on stage because they think, oh, I'm going to be up there and uh, I'll be nervous and they'll all be looking at me and they'll all. Do you know what really goes on during a speech is the people in the audience are taking in the information and and then they're mulling it over. And saying either that fits me or that doesn't fit me or that is convicting. Like, how do they know? They do, they know a lot more about me than I think that they are letting on. They're talking about me. And I, you know, when you and I, I, I hope we have some 
some prospective speakers who who maybe are in that spot but it it's it's not you're not being judged you, you're not being put on a pedestal you're giving them an opportunity to hear some things and believe me it'll shake around that head and when they leave They'll forget your name. They won't remember what color your suit was. They won't remember any of that stuff. But down the road, they remember possibly something that you said. So you're actually doing them a favor. Yes. And, yes. and I would package it like that to, to, to mm -hmm. really encourage someone to, yeah. to be a speaker if they do have a story that can help others. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, the, the concept of stage is, well, as one, one lady said, I was interviewing a couple of days ago. She said, for me, anytime I open my mouth with a mission, with purpose, I'm on a stage. Even if it's just True. one person I'm talking to. Right. I like that. So yes. whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether it's in a networking meeting, whether it's in, in a, a small group situation, speaking doesn't have to be Tony Robbins auditorium, thousands, if not millions watching. Yes. No. Yes. You yes. do you. I think we've already heard today from Randy the toll of not being authentic. Right. So you don't try and be anybody else. You do oh. you. That's right. So special. So special. Yes. Okay. So Randy, you your tell tell us a bit about some of the speaking work that you've done because i know you got your book out in 2018 and that opened some stage work for you didn't it 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 did and and that that's i think that's just kind of a constant really uh project that that as a speaker you have to work on because yes there are a lot of speaking engagements but you have to match you know, it isn't just I have a story and I wrote a book and do you have a stage? It's there's so much more than that. Do you actually fit the the topics and and the um, the theme of this particular uh, event? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot that goes into it. And I, I and I, I, I have learned a ton. But um, right now, I have taken my my message and I've, I've really kind of turned to something that, that I, I really, really have enjoyed. And that's the, the, the um, topic of resilience. And so I dove into resilience. Um, and, and there's a good example of where I took my story, but my story wasn't enough because what, what is it that lies within my story that can be plucked out and examined and talked about that can then shed a lot of light and value on someone else's life in their mind as they listen to me, as they listen to the podcast. So that's, that, that has been part of my learning curve with, with speaking. Okay. And so I really believe that resilience is what keeps people together. I think, I think it, it's what keeps people moving forward if they desire to move forward, I, I think it's what takes the most difficult of times and through time turns them into jewels. It, it's, it's what, it's what helps you get through something you, when you woke up in the morning, you never thought you could get, get through. And I think that there is a, there's this manifestation of, okay, if I can get through that, and I always challenge people, think of something you didn't think you could get through, but you did. And now as you look back, it, it's kind of adding up. Like it's almost good that you had to go through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you become tougher and more resilient because you've been through that and handled that properly. Let's go forward to the next one that's going to happen. We don't know what it is or when it's going to happen, but we know there's going to be another one. OK, you are stronger. And I, I always th th this this onion the layers of the onion, I, I, I talk a lot about because now we've got an extra th powerful, thick layer on that onion because of the way I just handled this adversity. Mm -hmm. Now, when the next one hits, I take the same approach and I have a very easy three step approach as, as to how because. I had to look at how did I get through some things I went through and I had to try to boil it down to three, three pieces. 
And that's what I teach people, those three pieces. If they can do that next October, another giant shell of protection and resilience and resolve um, is added to their game. Now, what is it that's going to define them? I don't think there's anything that's going to define them. I think they're, I think they have are building this, this resilience within themselves that is going to be pretty, pretty difficult to break. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think there's a, a growing factor to it. Absolutely. And that's what I love about resilience because uh, the, the thing we know is that pain plays no favorites. Adversity plays no favorites. And like it says in my book, I, I have a, a tale of a, a grandmother and, his, and, and her grandson that go house to house. And their goal is to find somebody that hasn't had any adversity or, or, or any, or any uh, misfortune in their life. And they go forever and never find one. And we're all in that boat. Yes. So, but if you think about how on a daily basis people react uh, to things and reacting is very, is very dangerous. Responding mm -hmm. is much better and mature and, yes. and has much more insight to it. Um, we can learn on a daily basis how to get through difficult things. And believe me, a light that seems like it's extra read for a long time is not part of the reasons you should fall apart and scream at somebody or honk your horn or whatever but that's just an example mm -hmm. and if we i mean if if we're going to get if we're going to get that that week in that moment what's going to happen when the real tough stuff hits yes so i think resilience is something we can work on every day Excellent. So this is this is the, the theme of your program that you've developed yes. as a result of your experiences through life and is based on the, the experiences that you've shared in the book. Correct. Beautiful. Correct. Who, do you, who do you primarily work with? Well, I have a. I have a group that I'm very interested in working with now. It's not the only group I will work with, but men um, men in a corporate setting, uh, and this avatar, Wendy, is actually me disguised as me because I know I can work with me. Yes. Because I've been there. But, but hardworking, hardworking men that are, that are in, a, in a corporate type of environment, or maybe they're an entrepreneur who's really, really spending a lot of hours to, to get a business turned, mm -hmm. who, who actually has found some dissatisfaction in life who um, who feels blue way too much and blue turns to darkness by the way yes. that's the, that, that's where the colors go from blue to dark yes and 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 maybe are not giving themselves their all to their family or mm -hmm. to their relationship and probably <clears throat> have found escapism as one of their pastimes yes okay and this whole thing about the man cave, well, the man cave is a real thing, not the real man cave with all the big TVs watching football, the man cave in your mind and in your heart, where you are disassociating yourself with a lot of things in life that you should be very much associated to. So, yeah, guys that are starting to lose their way a little bit, because that's where I was. Yeah. And so are you looking at gen guys who are... 40 plus 50 plus have you got a specific yes, yeah. demographic it's it's 45 to 60 45 to it's 60. my demographic yep mm -hmm. sure yep. sure um, and i'm assuming that this i'm going to make a sweeping assumption here because you and i met online is this something right. that you offer online or does it have yes. to be done in person yes it, it it can be it's probably in most cases going to be online just because mm -hmm. that's you know you find people all over the world yeah. you know, who want to chat. Yes. And, uh, but I'm definitely open to working uh, and eyeball to eyeball. If it's somebody that's close in proximity too, uh, cause there's great value in that. And is it but, an individual session or is it a group program? How does it work? Uh, right now, everything I do is, is individual. I, I have, uh, I, I have very, um, I, I'm really kind of feeling, uh, a push, uh, to, to work into some group work, but right now it's individual 
And you, you know, the most difficult thing for a guy to do is to admit that he's involved in things that he's shameful of. Yes. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 I really. That's why have, I was oh, wondering whether it would be a group situation because you'd need to yes. be very careful about the safe yes. space that yes, you're, you're creating right. for the guys to feel comfortable enough to go. Yes. Actually, that's me. Yes. Yeah. It, it'll have a different goal. Mm. It really will. It'll mm. have different parameters. Yeah. But, but I have a, I, I, I have a really good sense when, when somebody is getting emotional and they're getting to the point where they are ready to, to, to spill some beans, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot. Sometimes it's a lot. And, and then you know that, that you've done the right thing by, and typically it's followed Wendy by the comment of, I, I feel so good. I'm so relieved. I got to tell you, I've never told anybody this in my life. Yeah. I get that yeah. a lot. Yes. That's great. That's a breakthrough. And I congratulate yeah. you for that. Absolutely. And, and it shows that, that, you are setting up this safe space for them because yes. if they've never yes. said it to anybody else, that's because there's been a lack of trust with anybody around them. And you're right. obviously creating this safe space, non-judgmental space that says, you can't tell me anything I'm going to get shocked at because right. I've been there. I've done it. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I call it, I, I actually call this share first. I think anytime that, that you're meeting with someone that you don't know very well. And I'm not, it, it can just be somebody from your church. It can be a neighbor or whatever, but anytime you share first and it's something that might shock the other person or uh, help them to realize that you're a lot more human than, than they thought you were. If you share first, it is unbelievable how wide open the floodgates can be for them now to have that invitation to share. Yes. But if you try to do it the other way around, mm -hmm. it's you're going to get blocked. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. It's so, like sharing that vulnerability, isn't it? Because I yes, because you are being very vulnerable by sharing yes. that because you don't Absolutely. know the reaction you're going to get. And again, right. this is where the, the, the authors that I'm working with are, are, are finding a bit. Oh, that, that's putting me in a vulnerable position. Back to the what are people going to think of me? But as yes. Randy said. You are dropping in wonderful seeds that, yes, there's a risk involved. But as with anything, yes, you don't risk no it, point. Yes, you're not going to get anywhere at all. No. So thank you no. for sharing that. Yeah, You're only going to, wh what you're going to do, I can almost promise you, is you are just going to dig deeper. And you're going to dig so deep that you're going to say, I can't cut my losses now. I'm into this too deep. I can't tell anybody. Yeah. I know because that's what I told myself. Yes. But I've told guys, Wendy, I, you know, because one of the comments men, men will make is, oh, but I can't tell this stuff to my wife. I said, listen, you can't afford not to tell her. It's your choice. But if you don't, okay, this is going to get bigger and bigger and uglier and more pressurized. And if you let it go that far, she's not going to hang around anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a chance here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think people uh, inherently are pretty darn forgiving. Um, and, and we're all faulty, right? We got to remember that there are no perfect people. Yes. We're all faulty. So if you come to your spouse and you are really, I mean, really, genuine about what you were saying it will come off that way mm -hmm. and you know i i just i know it's hard to do but you might as well start with and when they start with me it's awesome because i just have a way to make them feel like they're telling a trusted friend and somebody that's already been there and they're safe with it and that's what i want yes. it it has to be like that yeah 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 Oh, great stuff, Randy. You're doing an amazing service. Amazing service. Thank you. So let, Thank let's you. recap then. You've been writing since you were a, a wee lad, given the, the 
modeling of your dad and your brother. Right. You started writing, which then led into the book back in 2018. We're percolating through now. You've done some stage work. You've done lots of podcasts. Have you done actual stages as well for summits and things? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've had an ex- exposure in all the, 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 the three main genres that I, I talk about in terms of being stages. Right. So as we're winding up, Randy, is there a, a couple of golden nuggets or even one that you can share with our audience? What do you do? to embody those words that are written on the page and then take them to whatever stage you are on at the time. Yeah. You know, one of my really favorite things to to talk about that I keep near and dear to me is it it has to do with a song that was published and became uh, uh, a hit back in the 60s. I beg your pardon, Nobody promised you a rose garden. And I love the song. The song says that when life started, nobody said every day was going to be perfect. But I believe that we get ourselves in a lot of trouble in relationships um, with with our career and and just us as, as people, as men, when we have a standard of, hey, that's not fair. That's not supposed to happen to me. That's supposed to not happen to my child. Um, and especially when big hurt hits, the, the way people react in big hurt is definitely a symptom of how they see how life was supposed to go. And they can't accept the fact that the worst things in this world may happen to you and that you have a choice you you can give up you can get up and stand in the in the same place the rest of your life or you can get up and move forward and that's my book is called rebound forward rebound meaning we're going to get up and forward meaning we're going to move forward Mm -hmm. and picking up on the basketball yes right right the basketball thing right and so uh, I just, um, there, there's, a, there's a song called Scarred But Smarter. And the first time I heard Scarred But Smarter by a band called Driving and Crying out of Atlanta, Georgia, and their lead man is Kevin Kinney. And the lyrics will blow you away. And it just says that, you know, I, they've already told you how it's going to be like, what it's going to be like out there, you know, and it's not going to be kind of like a bed of roses there are going to be some really difficult things and it warns you and i have since got to know kevin kenny on a personal level because he was kind of a one of these my, my, my rock star buddies that i didn't know never met him and when i met him i asked him very uh, very specifically about the lyrics because the lyrics meant a lot to me and uh, every time i see him which isn't enough but when i do see him we talk about scarred but smarter and uh, I, so that's a nugget I want to leave. I want people to understand that, that yeah, we would life, uh, like a perfect, um, error-free, pain-free life. But are you kidding me? Seriously. Uh, are you a golfer by chance, Wendy? No. I know I okay. come from Scotland, but I can't play golf. So, so this would be for all the golfers out there. But we could take this example and we, we could lay it on top of really any activity. Let's say that you got the incredible gift one morning that every time you got on the tee and hit a ball, it went in the cup. No matter if it was a if it was a 150 yard hole or a 600 yard hole, every shot. So you would play a round of 18 holes of golf and your score would be 18. Then your buddies call you and say, hey, do you want to go play golf tomorrow? And they go, yeah, that'd be cool. I'm going to get a hole in one every hole. And you do it again. Well, in a month, are you really that excited for life to go so perfect that you're going to get a hole in one every time? I don't think so. I think golf would get boring. Yeah, I do. And, you know, variety is the spice of life. Now, now n- nobody wants pain, uh, especially the, the kind of pain that, that myself and my family have had to endure. 
But I have just also told you a story about how I am the product of and the culmination of the person that went through all that. Yes. And there were many, many days where I asked God why. I asked the question why, and it's a tough question to ask because I didn't really understand why there needed to be that much pain and why I couldn't have my kids for more than four years. But, uh, but I didn't know at the time that, that, that there was reasoning behind all of it. And I get that. And I know I'm going to see him again. So yeah, scarred, but smarter, uh, Rose garden. I just think if we can take that approach into every day and into our life, when things happen, we are going to be way better off at handling them, putting another on, uh, layer of the onion on and moving forward in resilience. So for our, our authors who are going to get on stage, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. The more you do it, the more resilient you become. Is that word again? The more yes. familiar you become and ultimately comfortable. But to right. start with, it will be in your unfamiliar zone. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah, it's great. Actually, that, that that's how you get through it. Yeah. If you face it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Cindy, thank you so much. Is there anything as we're winding up? Is there anything that we've missed off? You know, I think everybody has a story and I think everybody has pockets full of seeds. Yes. Okay. Fill you, fill your, fill your pockets up every day. And you never know who you're talking to saying hello to someone who looks like they're having a tough day or sharing a good word with somebody or, 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 or buying a book. Here's a great one. You know, I'm a book buyer. I'm a sucker for buying books. Well, that sounds, that sounds like a good book and I'll buy it. And, and I've turned my rule into instead of buying it and marking it up and keep it because I might have to go back and refer to it. I give them away. I love to give books away to people all marked up, too, because they know mm -hmm. that there must be some good stuff in there. We can't do enough things for other people. And I just think that's all dropping seeds. And I would just implore everyone out there to and believe me, if you think you don't have anything to share, you, you, you're just not seeing it right. You do. You absolutely do, because you have a story yes. and. And you, you, you are, you're a wonderful person and you can share with people and make somebody's day bright as can be. So go ahead and do it every day. And people will pick up what they want to from your story. Yes. It may not be what you thought you were dropping in. Right. But they will pick up what they need to at that particular moment. That's the beauty of that, But that's for another day. Yes. Thank you so much, Randy, for sharing. Well, thank Thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk with you and, and, and share some of these ideas. And I hope it's, I hope it's helped. Um, I, I would love to hear from any and all of, uh, of the folks out there. Uh, it would be awesome. I'm sure you put the, you put that. We'll make sure your in, show notes are in uh, all of your in links the show, in the show notes. notes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Cause I, I love to hear from folks who have heard me on podcasts and things and, and uh, love to talk to them and, and help any way I can, but. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon, Randy, you, for sharing your from page to stage. From yes. us. Bye from us. <laughs>